Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Kubernetes Masterclass. Really happy to have you all uh, join us today, wherever you are in the world, whatever time it is for you. Oh, uh, We are just getting started, and so I want to wait uh, just a couple moments while people join the line. Uh, but I do want you all to know that this session is being recorded, and we will share the recording uh, and the slides uh, after the training. We have about an hour scheduled for today, uh, but if we need to go long, uh, don't worry, you won't miss anything. Uh, you will, as I said, get the uh, recording and the slides uh, emailed to you, so, so look for that in your inbox uh, after the session. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. We have a lot to get through uh, today. So as a way of introduction, my name is Matthew Shear. I'm a marketing manager here at Rancher. I included my contact information on the Rancher user Slack channel. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go. But if you do want to get in touch, uh, please consider me a point of uh, resource for you at Rancher. If you're looking for a specific training, specific doc, something like that, don't hesitate to, to reach out. I'm just at Matthew on Slack. And my email is Matthew at Rancher.com. Uh, but the man who's going to be doing the real heavy lifting for us on this training uh, is Kartik. Kartik, are you there? I am here. Uh, hi, Matthew. Awesome. So, so Kartik is the Senior Director of Solution Architecture at Tigera. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more as we go, but, but needless to say, he is our go-to person uh, for today. He's really going to be doing uh, all the work on the session. So let's get uh, a few of the, just the housekeeping items out of the way uh, so that we can get into the main content and the reason that you all are really here. Uh, so as I said, we have about an hour. Uh, we'll keep the questions, the answering of the questions to toward the end so that Kartik can just get through uh, his slides and his demo for us. Um, but if you do have questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat right now. I'll do my best to answer as many as possible just directly in the chat. Uh, and whatever ones that I can't answer, we'll, we'll keep for Kartik toward, uh, toward the end. Um, the other thing is that this is... You know, this is a master class, so we're going to be sticking more towards uh, the topic on implementing uh, network policy. But if you do have questions on Kubernetes, on Rancher, you know, don't hesitate to ask them. As I said, I'll do my best to answer. Uh, but we do have other trainings for those, uh, which I will talk about um, in a moment. Uh, and lastly, if for whatever reason you want your question to be private, just let us know. Otherwise, we'll answer it aloud for the benefit of everyone's because this is uh, for everybody's uh, education. Uh, and as I said, the session is recorded. We'll post it on YouTube. We post all of our trainings on YouTube. Uh, so do check those out, our online meetups. Um, and those go back uh, for years. So there's a ton of awesome uh, free uh, videos uh, to, to get up and running with, with Kubernetes and Rancher. Uh, as I said, also, there is a fantastic thriving communi community around this work. Uh, so you can get connected through our Slack channel. There's thousands of members, hundreds of people asking and answering questions every day. It's just slack.rancher.io. There's also a, a channel specifically for this masterclass series, just pound masterclass. Uh, we'll post uh, files there, if there's manifest, something like that, um, or announcements, we'll, we'll post there, those there too. And finally, we have a lot of upcoming classes. So this week we're doing our, our online meetup, our monthly online meetup. It's tomorrow we'll talk about uh, new technology for K3S uh, to help you uh, automate upgrading at the edge and at scale. That should be really, really cool. Um, and then for a lot of people, you might be totally new to Rancher and new to Kubernetes. So we do an intro session every week. It's totally free. It's live just like this. It goes an hour and a half, so it's a little longer. Uh, to help answer questions uh, and that is a fantastic place uh, to get to know Kubernetes and to get to know uh, Rancher and the value that Rancher uh, adds on top of it. Uh, Kartik will probably make some assumptions about what you already know uh, with Kubernetes and Rancher so if you are really new um, then please do join that session it is every week on Thursdays. So now that all of that is out of the way I can pass this off to, um, to Kartik to make him the presenter and of course uh, hopefully I, I share this to the right um, user, Kartik, because there are two now uh, since you have your backup. So I'm going to make an educated yeah. guess. And hopefully it goes to the right one, but we can we can make it. It's correct. actually the wrong one. Uh, can you can you go oh, back to the one? Will do. Will do. One second. Yeah, um, I, I normally run uh, Linux, and uh, since it, this is on a Mac, I just had a backup just in case. Perfect. There we go. Um, and do you see my screen okay? 
I do. You're good to go. Wonderful. So let me go into screen share mode. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today and look forward to this conversation. Um, as, uh, as Matthew said, I will, do, uh, I will make a couple of assumptions uh, around some basic knowledge around Kubernetes. But that said, the principles I'll be talking about today in terms of how you do dynamic network security in an orchestrator where your workloads are very dynamic and transient is applicable to other platforms as well. Uh, it's just that the focus is going to be predominantly on Kubernetes. And um, just to give you a little bit of context before I introduce uh, what Tigera does and what some of our, uh, the projects we're known for, whether it is uh, Calico and other sort of initiatives, um, before I give you an introduction to that, just to give you a little bit of context on why we are having this discussion on network policy today, I'd like to sort of call attention to the trend that's been happening over the last, let's say, eight to 10 years, right, in, in, in our domain, where workloads have increasingly been, uh, uh, increasingly been decomposed from monolithic applications to microservices. And typically, these microservices talk over some sort of a REST API between each other or over a, a network fabric. And interestingly, these microservices are deployed, containerized on a Kubernetes platform, uh, typically a platform such as Rancho RKE or one of the other sort of Kubernetes platforms that is so prevalent in the market today. Right? And the challenge that you'll find is that as these monolithic applications have transitioned to microservices, and these are typically just talking east-west between each other over REST APIs, ultimately the boundary for network security has moved from the parameter down to the individual workloads themselves. And uh, ultimately, a lot of organizations sort of struggle with this transition because uh, often the security teams are still in, uh, you know, still in the mindset of perimeter firewalls where you have a nice perimeter firewall and a, sort of a soft center that's wide open inside. And that, that, that sort of architecture doesn't necessarily hold forward or hold the same level of value in this new world of microservices where everything is dynamic. And interestingly, when you look at the individual microservices themselves on a platform like Kubernetes, as Kubernetes spins up pods and dynamically orchestrates them, uh, not just in an individual cluster, but increasingly across multiple clusters, these workloads are very transient. These workloads also show up with an IP address that can change as, as pods come and go, as pods are killed and restarted by Kubernetes. And all of these put a tremendous amount of pressure on sort of traditional network artifacts like parameter firewalls, WAFs, and other sort of um, security artifacts that are based on static constructs like static IP addresses or IP addresses that are long lived, right? So that's the fundamental problem that we're solving. So let's come back and introduce what Tigera, who Tigera is and what we do. So most of you are probably familiar from, uh, with Tigera as the company behind Calico. And Calico itself is extremely widely adopted in Kubernetes, but the Calico team at Tigera has actually been working upstream in Kubernetes since the early days in helping some of the constructs for not just uh, network security, but also for networking. And you'll find that the Calico team has been very influential and instrumental in developing concepts like network policy in Kubernetes that we'll be talking about today. Um, today, when you, when you look at uh, Rancher as a uh, platform, uh, as an example, you'll find that uh, Calico comes by default uh, within the Rancher platform, whether it's an RKE specifically, where you have uh, a technology called Canal, which is the default in, uh, in Rancher. And Canal is a, is a project started by the uh, Tigera team fundamentally providing the Calico policy implementation on top of Flannel networking. Uh, Tiger has also been the co-maintainer of Flannel for many years, but uh, also one of the options in Rancher is uh, Calico, uh, both for policy and for networking. So irrespective of whether you choose Calico, Canal, or Flannel, you'll find the, a very strong influence from Tigera in all of those default options within the Rancher platform. Uh, one other call out I'll make is that it's not just Rancher, but today you can use Rancher as a platform to manage a variety of Kubernetes platforms, including all of the major hosted public cloud offerings of Kubernetes. 
And one other call out I'll, I'll make here is that irrespective of whether you use Amazon EKS, Azure EKS, Google GKE, IBM Clouds IKS, or pretty much any of the other major Kubernetes hosted platforms, you'll find that all of those cloud providers have worked with Tegera to make Calico the default out of the box solution for network security within those platforms. And that's also true for most of the major commercial distributions of Kubernetes as well, and often many of the upstream installers do. So irrespective of where you deploy Kubernetes and which platform, you'll find that Calico is uh, seamlessly integrated and often be, uh, and typically often the out of the box, box default as well. Um, one other point I'll quickly mention is that the Calico team was also involved very early on in service mesh technologies like Istio and Envoy. Uh, we'll mention that briefly as we get into this uh, discussion on how we integrate seamlessly with Envoy, leveraging the work we did upstream in Envoy, which is a sidecar proxy used in common service mesh technologies. And uh, likewise, we've also been working very closely with the Istio service mesh in leveraging some of the more advanced concepts around X509 identity and how uh, a spiffy, uh, a concept called spiffy is used for identity in uh, service mesh deployments. And Tigera uh, engineer is actually one of the co-maintainers of that spiffy specification. So that's a quick introduction to uh, Tigera and Calico. And uh, let's get to the topic at hand, right? So the fundamental problem space that we are tackling is the fact that in a dynamic and declarative platform like Kubernetes, uh, application deployments are typ typically declarative, where you, as when you deploy an application in Kubernetes, you provide a manifest to, to your uh, orchestrator, your Kubernetes platform, uh, such as Rancher or RKE or one of the other Kubernetes platforms, and say, I want this deployment to happen. And the deployment could be a replica set, or it could be some other form of deployment where Kubernetes will then dynamically create pods for your application and then schedules these pods on different nodes in your cluster. Now, the challenge with that is each pod shows up with a dynamic and often transient IP address. And so how do you as a cluster operator or even as a developer secure the network flows within your application as your application components talk to other parts of your application stack? This is where the concept of network policy comes in that uh, the Calico team helped define upstream in Kubernetes. And because in Kubernetes, pod IPs are very dynamic and transient, you typically define uh, a concept called network policy that helps define what workloads are allowed to talk to each other. So you can enable fine-grained micro-segmentation amongst your workloads, um, typically within your cluster, but I'll also talk about the different controls that can provide access control to and from workloads within your cluster to other uh, services outside as well. The fundamental attributes of network policy are that they are typically based on labels assigned to workloads in Kubernetes. So rather than defining your policy constructs based on IP addresses, you define them based on labels. Things like, I want to allow things labeled blue to talk to things labeled green, or things labeled stage equals production, to other things that also have the label stage equals production, or things label customer equals customer one, can talk to uh, things label customer equals customer two, right? So, and ultimately it's the job of a network policy implementation like Calico to dynamically map those labels into the pods that are um, running within your Kubernetes cluster as Kubernetes dynamically scales them and to create the micro segmentation rules and the tiny little firewalls within your host to implement those policy rules. Policies are also very declarative. So typically when you look at network policies, when you get to some of the examples, you'll find that um, these are based on uh, a similar premise as applications in Kubernetes. But when you get to some of the examples in, that I'll show you in the demo that I'll have at the end, you'll see some very powerful concepts of what you can express within network policy. And uh, I'll give you some very interesting uh, demos on how you can secure some of the more, uh, you can enable some of the more advanced network security controls as part of this baseline declarative policy model in Kubernetes. The third attribute is that unlike traditional firewalls or WAPs, where things tend to be very static, in Kubernetes, 
strategy, your workloads are extremely dynamic. And this is where a technology like Calico really shines in the ability to dynamically create these policy rules across uh, potentially very large clusters at scale uh, and potentially across millions of workloads. Uh, this is one of the reasons why um, pretty much all of the major cloud providers have picked Calico as the out of the box default for network security is partly because it can deal with very large scale but can also enable these security controls with a lot of simplicity. And I think the demo will illustrate some of the simplicity behind Calico as well. So with, with a little bit of apologies to those of you who aren't uh, voting during Super Tuesday today in some parts of the US, uh, I did borrow a little bit of an election manifesto uh, theme here. So the fundamental premise that Calico takes forward is this concept of enabling zero trust networking, which is within a platform like Kubernetes, uh, as you have services talking to each other, what you're doing is fundamentally using some form of identity to authenticate every flow of communication between any pair of microservices, but more specifically to ensure that those communications are authorized for the specific kinds of flows that are occurring. So if you have a flow that's a backend application talking to a database, is that backend application supposed to talk to the database, i.e. making sure the correct policy authorization is in place, and then going back and being able to audit exactly what happened. So the fundamental premises that Calico brings forward are, like I said before, this concept of enabling policy as code, where you declare your policy in lockstep with your application deployment. Calico itself derives its workload identity from the underlying orchestrator, typically Kubernetes, where we get the network identity, so from a platform like Rancher, RKE, or one of the other Kubernetes platforms, but potentially also from um, um, service mesh technologies like Istio, where we can derive the application identity in the form of X519 certificates, or potentially a JOT tokens, where um, uh, Istio leverages a concept called Spiffy that the uh, team at Tigera actually helps co-maintain, and ultimately the Calico policy model can use both the network identity as well as the application level X509 identity to validate that the workload is indeed who they claim to be. Thirdly, that policy enforcement can happen uh, leveraging Calico's integration with various potential enforcement points. At the host level, typically uh, in, in the context of the Calico policy that is providing enforcement at the virtual ethernet, connecting the pod to the host within Kubernetes, but leveraging the integration that the, and the upstream contributions that the Calico team made into Envoy to provide, um, to provide additional uh, authorization filters. So for example, the specific authorization filter called external auth Z contributed, con was contributed to Envoy by the Calico team can also enable your policy enforcement from Calico to happen inside of your pod in Kubernetes. And finally, Calico itself works on multiple platforms, obviously Linux, which is one of the most common platforms for Kubernetes, but has also can also work seamlessly on Windows as well, uh, as some of you start to uh, explore Windows on platforms like Rancher. And finally, the Calico policy model itself is a unified network level all the way to the application level policy model. In this session, we'll predominantly focus on the network level policies, but perhaps we can tee up a follow-up session to go further into the application level as well, uh, where we can specify things like HTTP attributes, gets versus puts versus posts within the Calico policy model. So let's start by just doing a very basic Kubernetes network policy example, right? So assuming you have a, a few applications like a front-end application and a, say, a uh, database applications. Uh, a typical developer is going to label their deployments in Kubernetes within their manifest, where they might assign a label, say, called role equals front end to the front end applications, and another label called role equals DB to the database applications. And ultimately, in Kubernetes network policy, you have this concept of uh, defining an object called network policy. And rather than expressing isolation controls in the form of IP addresses, you express this in the form of labels. So things like 
in this example, what we're saying is that this network policy object is applied to any object that has the label role equals database. So as Kubernetes dynamically spins up pods with that label, this network policy needs to be instantiated on those objects. And it's typically the role of Calico to go about enabling that level of dynamic policy control. And the policy rule itself says that when I apply this policy on this pod, what I'm going to do is move that pod or workload into a default deny mode. And specifically, we'll have to allow uh, accesses from specific applications. And Kubernetes network policy allows you uh, access from either TCP or UDP within the rules, or potentially now SCTP, or even CIDRs, uh, CIDR ranges within your policy rule. In this example, the policy rule says, I'm going to allow traffic from anything labeled role equals front end on TCP port 6379. So as you have additional front end pods getting created, Calico will dynamically create the micro segmentation rules within the host to enable any front end pod in the cluster to talk to any database pod in your cluster uh, that has that particular label with the port uh, on TCP port 6379 but not permit any other pods to talk to the database pods in your cluster. And this is all orchestrated dynamically by Calico, leveraging the underlying kernel, typically the Linux kernel using IP tables and IP sets, or even more recently with eBPF. Uh, or if you're running Windows, leveraging the underlying Windows kernel facilities, such as the Hyper-V DFP layer as well. Now, that's great from a Kubernetes network policy example where you can express some very basic primitives like allowing different TCP or UDP ports, but that may not be sufficient for a lot of users. And from that perspective, Calico is actually, Calico has a, uh, another policy model called uh, the Calico policy model, which is a fairly significant superset of the Kubernetes policy model. Again, I want to reinforce that this comes de by default out of the box within your Rancher platform. So literally the only thing you have to do when you deploy Rancher with say Canal or Calico is simply start using these policy options. Some of the benefits of using the Calico policy model are highlighted in this slide here. So specifically, in addition to just having allow rules like in the case of Kubernetes network policy, you do have the option of creating other kinds of actions. I've called out a deny action here. I've called out a log action here. The role of a deny action, obviously, is to deny packets. Uh, the, act, the role of a log action is to log the traffic that is being filtered by that policy rule. So if you want to have additional visibility. Um, you can also sequence your policy rules leveraging this order field. So you can actually define which policy gets instantiated first and what follows it. Um, notice I have this other thing called a service account which I can use within my uh, policy selectors. For those of you who are not familiar with Kubernetes, Kubernetes has some advanced concepts around role-based access control. But when you get to the demo, you'll notice that typically Kubernetes network policy is based on pod labels. And unfortunately in Kubernetes, pod labels have no RBAC. So any user or developer, if they have access to change labels uh, within the application, they can delete a label or add a label and bypass policy. Service accounts are controlled by RBAC in Kubernetes. So when you use a service account label, such as in the Calico policy model, it gives the operator of the cluster and security teams more advanced controls where they can determine whether or not they will give individual developers RBAC access to read, update, delete, or modify uh, labels associated with an application. So this gives you a lot more advanced controls. The last point I'll make is that Calico policies, such as a, a network policy here, can coexist with Kubernetes network policies. So it's not like you have to choose one or the other. You can have them work, uh, have them both work seamlessly within your rancher or other Kubernetes clusters. And again, like I said, given that Calico comes by default out of the box with all of the major Kubernetes platforms, all you have to do to enable this is simply start using it. One last extension I'll discuss. I mean, there's a number of other capabilities with the Calico policy model that are very powerful, but I did mention that the Calico policy model is a unified layer three to layer seven policy model. 
And specifically within the same policy, not only can you exp express network level constructs like allowing TCP port 6379, but you can also specify HTTP attributes like specifying I want to allow a HTTP post on a given path or a path with a wildcard. And this leverages the deeper integration that the Calico team had has completed with Envoy going back a couple of years. In fact, uh, leveraging the um, authorization filter that uh, the Calico team contributed upstream into Envoy uh, a couple of years ago. So ultimately, the policy model is simply a unified network all the way to application layer policy model. And uh, the benefit of this is that you don't need to start your deployments with a service mesh like uh, Envoy or Istio, but it allows you to gradually bring in more advanced concepts like a service mesh as you need to, but the same policies seamlessly work as you, as you start to uh, uh, adopt a service mesh as well. So to summarize, the fundamental concept that I think uh, you need to consider as you start looking at how you use policies is given that policies are declarative and expressed as code, and uh, you know, it's, it's debatable whether you would call YAML as code or you're really YAML is just a option for markup language. Uh, ultimately, what you're doing is you're managing your policy objects in the same manner as you would manage your application deployments in Kubernetes. So as you deploy uh, uh, your applications into something like Rancher to be orchestrated across one or more clusters, including RKE, you simply manage your network policies with the same sort of GitOps processes and CI CD as you would your applications. Now, one last comment I'll make is that um, for, for, for the most part until now, we've talked about the policy enforcement where Calico policies are being enforced at the interface connecting the pod into the host. So literally before the pod is even able to send traffic into the host or receive any traffic from the wire back into itself, Calico provides these micro segmentation rules dynamically based on workloads coming and going across your cluster. But one thing you'll, you'll observe is that increasingly some of the most sophisticated network bound attacks on Kubernetes aren't attacking necessarily just the pods, but are often attacking the host in Kubernetes and potentially the Kubernetes control plane itself. And one of the powerful features that Calico provides is you can use the same policy model to not just protect pods in, in Kubernetes, but also protect the host interfaces, including on standalone virtual machines or cloud VMs or cloud instances. But uh, more specifically, also to protect the Kubernetes control plane itself, so things like the kubelet or the API server or etcd, or other components running in Kubernetes, including Kubernetes services as well. And this is something I will illustrate in the demo as I walk through the demo as well, because this is a very powerful capability. So the takeaway from this is literally, it, it is bits on the wire. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from the pod, it doesn't matter if it's coming from the host, it doesn't matter if it's coming from the control plane, if it's pods talking to the control plane, such as the API server, if it's pods talking to each other, if it's the control plane talking to each other, all of those network bound traffic can be secured using Calico policy. And that is a extremely powerful statement to make. Literally, if it's bits on the wire, you should be able to secure them using Calico. And in, uh, when I get to the demo, I'll distinguish between this concept of workload endpoints, which is where we are protecting the pods themselves, versus host endpoints where we are protecting the host. So just to summarize uh, a little bit before I get to the demo, uh, the fundamental benefit of the Calico approach around cloud native security in platforms like Kubernetes is, again, ultimately the fact that this is dynamic, declarative, and managed natively using Kubernetes, as Kubernetes dynamically orchestrates workloads up and down. And uh, this is where ultimately you'll find that traditional net network security artifacts like parameter firewalls, RAFs, other components really lack the depth of uh, not just the integration, but the more advanced constructs to enable this to work at scale in Kubernetes. And this is one of the reasons why today, when you look at any major Kubernetes platform, Typically, they come uh, out of the box with Calico enabled as the policy layer within it. In terms of how Calico itself enforces those rules, like I said, we leverage the underlying um, kernel 
so Calico itself simply creates the rules uh, using whatever user space libraries are provided in APIs. And in the case of Linux, we provide an option of either using IP tables and IP sets um, or eBPF. Uh, specifically with IP tables and IP set, the concept of an IP set is a construct which is very powerful and allows you to take a large number of IP tables rule lookups and collapse them into a single hash lookup within the Linux kernel. So rather than looking up large sequences of IP tables rules, the way that Calico implements filtering down to individual pods is a single hash lookup in the kernel and uh, for a potentially a large range of IP addresses. So this is a very powerful and extremely scalable way of doing IP tables. Uh, alternatively, we have some, some folks that also like the power of eBPF and eBPF provides the way to hook in arbitrary bytecode into the Linux kernel at various points. And uh, eBPF can plug into various points of the Linux networking stack, including the socket layer, including the IP tables layer, including the traffic control layer and various other points all the way down to the device driver. And Calico recently has a, uh, a, a capability of also providing a data plane leveraging eBPF as well. Similarly, Calico can also work on Windows. We, the Calico team collaborated with Microsoft on this. And uh, in collaboration with the Microsoft uh, uh, development team, Calico policies can be seamlessly enforced on Windows as well, leveraging the host networking service and the underlying Windows kernel as well. So ultimately, Calico leverages the best underlying data plane that is provided by the underlying host. Um, so just to summarize, uh, you know, as you get to, to production deployments of Kubernetes, you'll have to start to investigate some of the constructs around not just being able to use concepts like network policy, but what does it take to scale in production? And I'll come back and discuss this as we wrap up here. Um, I'll hold this thought on the, uh, the partnership and what we're doing together between Tibera and Rancher for later. But uh, just to summarize, and I want to get to a demo here because the demo will give you a little bit more for some of the powerful concepts. And I'll also do a very quick plug at the end for this product called Calico Enterprise that builds on top of Calico with some of the more advanced security controls and uh, network security workflows that your security teams within your organizations would, would appreciate as they get to some of the more challenging requirements around the traditional security functions that they need to ensure uh, a good security posture, Calico Enterprise helps check off some of those advanced uh, visibility access controls, audit, compliance, intrusion detection, threat feeds, and a number of additional capabilities there. And uh, Calico Enterprise itself, the intent with this uh, session is not to go into Calico Enterprise, but to focus on just vanilla uh, upstream standard open source Calico as available with Rancher. And so I will focus on that right now within the demo. So just to give you a little bit of a, 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 a insight onto what the demo is going to be doing in terms of the different use cases for network policy, I'm going to use a sample microservice application where there is three different uh, microservices talking to each other for a, let's call it a online bank. It's a, just a, a synthetic application where you log in via the front end uh, customer pod, which provided which provides a web UI. And the customer pod happens to be talking to a bunch of summary microservices, which provide the business logic. And the summary microservices talk to a bunch of database pods or database services, which provide the backend data store. And ultimately, when you log in via the internet to the customer pod, you get access to this, your, you know, your online bank with perhaps your bank balance. Now, let's go launch some attacks on this, right? So this is a internet facing application. And to illustrate the power of network policy, what we're gonna do first is we're going to assume that that customer pod gets hacked because it is facing the internet. Perhaps it's a poorly written application. And Leveraging that attacked customer pod, the attacker is going to try and target the database directly and try and talk to the database. So that's the first attack we're going to launch. The second attack is now that the attacker is in your environment, perhaps he has access to your X509 certificates and can launch more advanced attacks. I don't have time to go into this one, so I might actually skip this one to see, show you, a, a, you know, some of the power of the Calico application layer policy model in a subsequent webinar. 
But the third attack I'm going to launch as an attacker is then talk back to a command and control server or the internet to perhaps enable some data exfiltration, such as some uh, PII information that I've, I've ex taken from the database. The fourth attack I'm going to launch is I'm going to potentially launch attacks against the Kubernetes control plane itself, including components like the API server or etcd. The fifth attack I'm going to launch is potentially launch attacks on host-based services, including Kubernetes services such as node ports or other service types. And so what I'm going to show you is how you can protect against all of them with Calico policy. So let's start there and let me take you to uh, my cluster, which happens to be running RKE. And it's just a very simple cluster. The main thing is I'm running Calico as part of this cluster. So it's pretty, it's a pretty standard uh, RKE cluster. And to begin with, I'm going to just deploy this Yao Bank application. And it's, I've created these microservices. So if I do a few couple get pods within the Yao Bank namespace, notice these pods are running. If I go to my web browser and access this application, there you go. Um, this is Spike is the guy that wrote this application, but you know, in effect, guess what? I'm getting to the bank balance and I'm able to see this little account here. Now let's go launch some attacks on this application. Let's first figure out the pod name. So there is the pod name. And let me just cube cuddle exec into the pod and do a, um, let me figure out. Actually, uh, I need to get the command there here. So I'm gonna attack the database directly. So let's do this. So now what I just did there is from the customer pod, I've gone directly to the database. And when I did that, notice that I'm not just able to see my account, but I'm able to see everyone's account by going directly to the database. So in effect, what has happened is since we have left the database unprotected, we're able to log into everyone's account. So let's use some policy to protect that. So let's do a kubectl apply uh, some network policy. And what that network policy is, is basically saying that for anything that's labeled app equals database, I am only going to allow traffic from things labeled app equals summary. So it's a very basic and primitive uh, Kubernetes network policy saying the database will only allow things from summary and not from the customer pod. So now if I go back and rerun that attack, notice that at this point, this uh, curl from the customer pod to the database times out. So that's good, we prevented that attack. Now, how can we expand on that, right? And so there's additional things we can do here. Let's do a couple of things. Let's do, a... that's great that we've now protected the database pod, but why don't we just protect every other pod within the cluster, i.e. let's move the cluster into a global default deny mode where no pod will be able to talk to any other pod unless there is a network policy in place. In Calico, this construct is a very powerful concept, which is the ability to define policies across the entire cluster. And this concept of default deny is enabled by simply matching on every pod, so having a selector of all, but then not providing any ingress or egress statements. So in effect, by applying this very simple network policy, what I've done is I've put my entire cluster into default deny mode. Now, if I go back and try and um, access my uh, application again, guess what? I'm not able to because the cluster is in default deny mode. The customer pod is not able to talk to the summary pod. The summary pod is not able to talk to the database pod. So nothing actually works unless I as a developer go in and create some policies. So let's do that. Let's do a... Uh, actually, first, even before that, we need to do one more thing, which is to allow DNS, right? So if I do a kubectl exec into the customer pod, so if I do a dig, I can't access anything. I can't even do DNS lookup. So let's first allow DNS. Uh, actually, I need to get out of the pod here.
And basically what that DNS is doing, DNS policy is doing is saying, I'm allowing every pod to do DNS lookups within my cluster, right? So I'm just allowing traffic to the cube DNS server. Now, if I go into the pod, I should be able to do things like dig google.com. But if I try to actually ping anything outside, that doesn't work because my cluster is in default deny. So then let's add some policies for my actual microservice application. So let's do a few couple, let me get out of the pod. Let me create that policies. What those policies are saying is that I'm creating a policy saying the summary pod is allowed allowing traffic from things labeled customer. And similarly, the customer pod is allowing things, uh, sorry, the uh, customer pod is allowing things from anywhere, including out from the internet on TCP port 80. So now, since I've applied that policy, if I go back and uh, refresh the Yao Bank application, guess what? The connectivity works again. So in effect, what I've done is I put my cluster into default deny, and now I've allowed traffic uh, from the customer part to go to the summary part, the summary part to go to the database part. So my application itself works, but if I have other developers across my cluster that haven't defined network policies, guess what? They will not be able to, uh, the application will not work because guess what? They've been lazy. Now, let's take it one level further. If you look at this policy that, let's say my developer has defined, it's great that he's created a policy allowing the customer pod to access, or the summary pod to allow traffic from the customer pod. But notice he's given egress controls where he's allowing the summary pod to talk to the whole world. Similarly, on the customer pod, he has created an egress policy within the Kubernetes network policy saying, I am going to give this customer pod the ability to initiate TCP connections to the rest of the internet, which may not be a good thing because what happens if this pod gets attacked and someone, the attacker, tries to attempt a data exfiltration using that pod? So maybe you don't want to permit that. So how do you prevent that? So let's do this. Let's create do an egress lockdown policy. That egress lockdown policy, if you look at what that is, we're basically creating a policy that is global. It's a Calico policy that is global across the cluster at a higher precedence. So it's got a, the, a lower order values indicates that this is applied with higher precedence. And basically we are only allowing traffic from pods that have the service account label called internet egress equals allowed. And only those pods are allowed to talk to the world. All of the other pods and, and so for pods, uh, all of the pods that, uh, other pods, we will basically deny any traffic that is not destined to the CIDR ranges specific to the cluster. In other words, we are restricting all other pods to only talk within the cluster. So this happens to be my pod CIDR. This happens to be my service CIDR within Kubernetes. This happens to be my external CIDR. And uh, fundamentally what we're saying is only pods that have the label service account selector internet egress equals allowed. In Kubernetes, every pod has a service account assigned automatically, independent of whether you choose one or not. If you don't specify one in your manifest, you will be assigned the default service account in Kubernetes. But like I mentioned, service accounts and service account labels are controlled via RBAC. So who is allowed to get this label is something that you as a cluster operator or as a platform team can specify. So now that I've done that, let's go back and do a, a, a let's walk in, get, let's get into the pod. And now let's obviously do a dig. Uh, this will still work because my, I still allow DNS. If I do a ping, guess what? I can't get out to the public internet because I have restricted access to just specific pods. Let's actually now label this pod. Maybe we want to allow the customer pod individual access, but I'm going to create this label as a cluster operator or as a platform team with additional RBAC privileges. So what I do is I do a few cuttle label service account. 
in the Yao Bank namespace, the customer service account, which I've deployed my customer pod with, with the label internet egress equals allowed. So essentially I've created that label allowing that customer pod access to the internet. Now, if I go back to that pod and try that access, guess what? Because I now have the service account label on that pod, it's been given access. Now that's all great because, you know, in effect, what we've done is we've now given fine grain access control to every pod within my cluster. Now let's get to some of the more advanced controls you can do at the host level in Calico. To illustrate that, I'm first going to go to uh, another host outside of my Kubernetes cluster. It happens to be, it happens to have network access to my Kubernetes cluster. But from there, I'm going to do a very simple curl, dash K. Actually, I don't even need the dash K, I'll just do a dash V. So if you look at what I'm doing here, I'm just doing a curl to the master node in my Kubernetes cluster on port 2379. And my Kubernetes cluster is actually a Rancho RK cluster running etcd. So if I do that, etcd happens to be the data store for Kubernetes. And guess what? I am able to access etcd. So my Rancher deployment has left my etcd access open to the world. There's probably good reasons for that because guess what? You might need to have different etcd instances on different masters talking to each other. But is there any particular reason why that etcd instance needs to be allowed access from the whole world? I would encourage all of you to go back and look at your Rancher deployments to see if you left parts of your Kubernetes control plane, things like your kubelet, things like your etcd service, which is ultimately the brains behind your Kubernetes deployment. Uh, have you left them with world access? That's not good. There's no reason to have etcd accessible from outside the Kubernetes cluster. So guess what? Right now I can access it and that's not good at all. So how do we protect that? So let's do a... So first I'm gonna create some policies protecting the host. And to show you what those policies are, in effect, I am, I've created some policies saying if the node role, the host role is a Kubernetes master based on the node label, I am only allowing access to specific control plane ports, but only from other master nodes. So only other master nodes can access etcd. Only other master nodes can access things like, uh, you know, the kubelet and some of the other control plane components. And uh, the 6443, I might need to allow access from the outside world. So I have a separate policy saying if on, on masters, I'm allowing world access to ports like 6443. Similarly, I might, on a worker node, I have a policy saying I only allow access to the kubelet and not other services. And one last policy I have is maybe I don't want to use node ports, so I'm locking down node ports saying I'm going to deny access to any of the node port range. And notice in Calico, there's some ad advanced features like pre dnat to, al to allow policies to apply to Kubernetes services in addition to Kubernetes pods. So now that I've done that, let's actually create the host endpoints. So if I do a kubectl apply dash f, and what that host endpoint is, is simply a object in the Calico data store, which is Kubernetes, saying that for, the, uh, for this particular master node, I've created a host endpoint, but in this case, protecting the host interface for the IP address I'm expecting on the host and the host name I'm expecting for the host. Similarly, for each of the two worker nodes I have in my cluster. So in this case, in effect, now Calico, in addition to protecting the pod interfaces, is also protecting the host interfaces. So now if I come back and launch the same uh, attack from here, guess what? This one times out because there's really no reason for etcd to be given access from the rest of the world. So that's great. That's not it though. Guess what? This service I was accessing for my Yao Bank application, that's a node port. Now I've, defined, I've denied node ports. So guess what? I'm not able to access my application anymore, right? So guess what? That's not good either. Let's create one more policy. 
I'll do a, actually I'm on the wrong host here. Let me go to my uh, cube cuddle. And if you look at what this policy is, in this policy, I'm basically saying for selected node ports, like in the case of my Yawbank application, I am going to allow traffic to that particular node port leveraging this advanced Calico feature called apply on forward, which allows that policy to apply on Kubernetes services. And with this pre DNAT rule, so this is prior to Cube Proxy doing its uh, DNAT as part of its service forwarding in Kubernetes. So in effect, we can use the same Calico policy model to protect your services in Kubernetes as well, in addition to protecting your pods. And now that we've allowed that access, and so let's go back and refresh, and guess what? Now I'm able to access my node port again. But in this case, the access to that node port is now controlled by the administrator, rather than allowing individual users to create their own node port services based on random ports, right? So again, it, ultimately what these policy constructs do is provide more advanced controls, not just to developers, as in the case of Kubernetes network policy, but to cluster operators, to security teams and platform teams with some of the more advanced controls and Calico policies and Calico global network policies to lock down your cluster, lock down not just the pods in your cluster, but also the hosts themselves, lock down the Kubernetes control plane, as well as when uh, enable policy driven control for when pods are given access to, to control plane components or even to things outside the cluster. So just to wrap up here, what you hopefully saw there was a number of network bound attacks that you can trivially protect with policy, leveraging some advanced controls in the Calico policy model, including the ability to put your cluster into default deny state. And uh, just to wrap up here and just take a few questions, Kubernetes network policy provides some, you know, very flexible controls to enable segmentation controls for your workloads. But Calico is a pretty sophisticated superset above and beyond Kubernetes network policy that can coexist together with Kubernetes network policy. It is, it comes out of the box with pretty much every major Kubernetes platform. All of the major cloud providers have picked Calico and provide it out of the box as the default. Uh, it is also the default within your rancher deployments, irrespective of whether you use Canal or Calico as your network plugin option. And um, in, in terms of using it, literally the only thing you have to do is to use your network policies. And finally, uh, Calico is really proven at scale, leveraging um, the work that the Calico team has provided in building a very sophisticated architecture around extremely scalable deployments, uh, allowing policies to be defined in a declarative manner, but dynamically be, being instantiated by Calico in, uh, in, a, in a distributed manner across very large clusters. And just to tee up a topic for a future discussion, Calico, what we talked about here is just the, is the policy part. In the future, we can, we, we'd be happy to come back and do a follow-up webinar that we can go deeper into the more advanced application layer controls, leveraging service mesh technologies like SQ and Envoy, and what we do around security in these domains. Uh, again, provided out of the box within your environment in Rancho, but also potentially, you know, do a, have a quick discussion around um, things like Calico networking as well, which you get out of the box within your Rancho environment, right? One last quick plug, if this is not sufficient and you want even more advanced controls around being able to do more sophisticated security uh, workflows that your security team is looking for, come talk to Tigera about Calico Enterprise and we'd be happy to do a little bit more uh, of a walkthrough on some of those more advanced controls and visibility and audit and compliance features as well. So that said, I'm gonna pause here and take questions. And yeah. uh, Matthew? Shall we, shall we kick off? Yeah, let's do it. Karthi, thank you so much for going through that fantastic stuff. Um, so let's dive in here. There are several questions. Uh, so this first one's from David Michael who asks, how much Kubernetes do network fo folks need to know to manage network policy? Excellent question. So um, what we do 
is that in Calico, uh, uh, just baseline Calico that you get with Rancher, there is some artifacts that, uh, that leverage things like labels and having some awareness of your application. In Calico Enterprise, we literally make this really trivial to use where we can actually help build the policies for you and be able to do much more advanced uh, sort of uh, user-friendly and operator-friendly controls so that not only are your development teams using policies in Kubernetes, but also your security teams can sort of bring forward some of the concepts they're familiar with, but leverage them in Kubernetes. For example, deeper integration with firewalls so that your security teams that are used to defining firewall rules in a, uh, pano in a Palo Alto panorama or Fortinet or similar platforms can continue to do so, but we provide more deeper integrations. So we really target Calico Enterprise as more operator centric versus Calico itself provides all of the basic controls in a very Kubernetes native fashion. But uh, to answer the point, there is a little bit of knowledge required for, for network policy in Kubernetes, and we provide a number of sort of training options to allow you to use them in a, in a, in a seamless manner. Makes sense, okay, thank you very much. All right, here's the next one. This is from Joseph who asks, who do you see maintaining, deploying, and enforcing uh, these controls? Uh, secure, is it security team, is it devs? Excellent question. So what I showed you in the demo was a mix between uh, what you can do with devs using something like Kubernetes network policies or even uh, Calico network policies scoped to just a developer's namespace. But what I showed you in the demo was the ability to use more advanced Calico network policies leveraging RBAC controls, such as with service account labels, as well as global network policies, which are typically restricted to the uh, platform teams and our cluster operators and security teams. So Typically, both sets of teams can coexist, but with the platform teams and the security teams have, uh, you know, essentially retaining some of the more advanced RBAC permissions so that developers may not be able to compromise the cluster uh, security posture by making a mistake. Calico Enterprise takes it one level further by providing even more advanced controls for platform teams and developers, including visibility and more features. But uh, to, to briefly answer the question, Typically, it's a combination where the developers focus on their application and their namespaces, and the platform teams and the security teams ensure that they have good guardrails around individual developers and app teams within the cluster. So ensuring an overall security posture for the Kubernetes platform. All right, awesome. Um, okay, let's see. Um, here's another one. This is, this is also from David Michael who asks, when the policy blocks traffic, are those blocks logged somewhere? Yes, great question, David. So in, in, when I walked through the example, one of the policy actions I illustrated in the slides was Cal in Calico policy, you can have a log action. So right before you have a deny, you can create a, a rule with a log action and thereby log what is happening within that particular policy rule, including any of the IP fix information from the packet. But in addition, in Calico Enterprise, that is, there is a much more sophisticated set of visibility and observability features that target cluster operators, which allow you to get that observability at scale across potentially thousands, you know, tens or thousands of nodes and millions of flows. So not only are you getting the visibility down to the individual policy rule level, but a, a very sophisticated way of collecting this at clusters at scale and being able to visualize what is happening using some very advanced visualization tools. So if you're interested in that, David, or anyone else, please uh, ping us offline at Tagera or go to our, uh, you know, uh, come to tagera.io and uh, you, can, you can actually uh, get more information on Calico Enterprise, which targets cluster operators. But cool. for the baseline, okay. you, have, uh, you have the log action that give you, uh, in baseline Calico, that gives you some level of observability as to what's happening. Cool. All right. Awesome. Makes sense. All right. Here's the next one. This is from Marari, who asks, um, how do you restrict secrets from two different deployments that are in the same namespace? Yeah. And uh, secrets is a, uh, can mean, uh, so secrets in a Kubernetes context means something very specific, right? So what Calico is focused on is focused on network security. Literally, like I said, any bits on the wire that applications send to each other. In Kubernetes security, there's different, different domains of security which are important to consider. One is build time security while you're building your, your containers and being able to scan them for vulnerabilities, image provenance, and other features. 
Similarly, there's when uh, security and policy governance, when you present your application to the API server to validate that, you know, things like the user is being authenticated, the right uh, sort of application constructs are maintained. And then what Calico does is once your application has been deployed to the cluster to ensure that your application hasn't been compromised, the application instances are doing the right thing and they're, authorized, they're only doing the things they're authorized for. So what we focus on is the network security. Typically in a Kubernetes cluster like Rancho, you also want to have things like pod security policies and other controls over how your things like your secrets are managed, how you ensure RBAC around Kubernetes secrets, which are also a very distinct concept in Kubernetes. Uh, and ultimately that is governed by RBAC controls that you get in a platform like Rancher to ensure that secrets for individual users are um, locked down from other users of the platform. Great, okay, awesome, Kartik. Now I, I noticed we are right at time. There are several more questions. Are you willing to stay just a couple minutes? Or do, um, I'm happy to, to answer these and answer those questions. Okay, terrific. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all right, here, this one is from Amandeep, who says, um, could you explain what the service accounts field um, in the manifest you use in the demo means? Absolutely. Great question, Amandeep. So in Kubernetes, every pod obviously can use pod labels, which is what I provided in basic Kubernetes network policy, which is a developer level construct. Unfortunately, pod labels have no level of RBAC control. So any developer or user can change a pod label at any time. Every Kubernetes network, any Kubernetes deployment, on the other hand, is also automatically assigned to a service account, independent of whether or not you specify a service account in your manifest when you deploy your application. If you specify a given service account in Kubernetes, and you can create service accounts, or an operator can create service accounts within your cluster, uh, that service account is controlled via role-based access control including the ability to whether or not any user can access that service account and or create labels on that. So in my example, when I created a service account for my customer deployment uh, called customer, I restricted access to that service account as an operator, which means that when I created a network policy that said that only things with service account label internet egress equals allowed are allowed to access the external world, that label access is governed by me as an operator that allows me RBAC control, but I haven't given that RBAC to users and developers. What that allows me to do is to then use this concept called service accounts to do more fine-grained RBAC around my policies that I wouldn't be able to do with a baseline Kubernetes network policy, but I can with Calico network policies. So service accounts, again, is a fundamental Kubernetes construct. There is a lot of documentation in Kubernetes docs on how you use a service account. When, when you get to a service mesh like Istio, you'll find that uh, service accounts are also the concept used for assigning X509 identity to your workloads as well. So it's something that we recommend as something that every Kubernetes operator and user needs to be aware of and to ensure that every application in Kubernetes has a distinct service account with associated RBAC control. And hopefully that's a quick summary. I would encourage you, Amadeep, to go back and read some of the docs or uh, follow up with us, perhaps on the Calico users Slack channel, if you go to slack that, slack.projectcalico.org, and we can give you more information on this. Great, thank you so much. Okay, here, here's the next one. Uh, this is from Luis, who asks, um, how, are, how are labels enforced? Developers can put whatever labels they want. Excellent, that's what I just referred to, Louise, is that if you are using Kubernetes network policy, yes, that is based on pod labels where, where end users can use whatever labels they want. But if you coexist your Kubernetes network policies with Calico network policies, which are a superset, Calico network policies allow you to use things like service account labels and namespace labels. And specifically with things like service account labels, you can enable RBAC control over, over who has access to labels. So you as a cluster operator or a security team might say that only certain users are allowed to change and delete the labels versus you as a user uh, or as a cluster operator can, can do that. But developers are maybe only given read access to labels or perhaps uh, no access whatsoever. So typically cluster operators can get much more advanced RBAC using service account labels and potentially namespace labels as well. Cool, okay, makes sense, thank you. 
All right, here's another. This is from Thomas who asks, um, debugging a non, he says, um, debugging a non-working network connection between two microservices might get difficult depending on the number of policies deployed. Is there any tooling such as a GUI, logs, et cetera, that can help there? Absolutely, and that is a great plug for some of the value of Calico Enterprise. So Calico Enterprise is precisely targeted at capabilities like that, where you're troubleshooting connectivity, you're troubleshooting policy, you're troubleshooting why, uh, you know, why flows are being denied. Uh, and ultimately, this not just being able to do it at individual application level, but to allow a cluster operator to be able to visualize this at scale in production, but also delegate permissions such that users can log into the Calico Enterprise dashboard and be able to get the visibility down to individual flows using advanced visualization tools um, that show you what's happening between the applications in your cluster. The intent today was to focus just on baseline Calico as provided with uh, Rancher, but if you're interested in Calico Enterprise, please go to tagera.io and uh, we actually have a trial environment that hosted in the cloud that you can take for a spin. So I would encourage you to actually try it out and see if that might work for some of your needs. Great. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm, I think there's just we'll just take one more and then we'll 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 wrap it up. Um, this one is from Peter, uh, who says we want to use uh, Cilium Network Provider for performance. Can we still use Calico Policy Enforcement? Yeah. Great question, Peter. So I will. Uh, I, so first of all, I'll make the statement that uh, Cilium and Calico do similar things. Cilium sort of it works in a similar manner to Calico, but is uh, was developed much more uh, much more, you know, a, a, a good por portion of time after Calico was built. And you find that it, uh, as much as there's a little bit of uh, awareness of what Cilium does, it lacks some of the more advanced capabilities that Calico provides. Also, in regards to performance, I will, I will make the fairly strong claim here that uh, I can, generally speaking, take on any performance and scale situation and I can generally make the claim that I am super confident that Calico will be at the same performance, if not more. Again, having to do with the way Calico is architected, leveraging the underlying kernel facilities, both uh, IP tables with IP sets, which you'll find to be fairly good in many scenarios, leveraging the power of IP sets. But also Calico also provides eBPF as an alternate data plane, very similar to what Cilium does. So just as Cilium leverages some features of eBPF in the Linux kernel, Calico does provide that option as well. So I will make the fairly bold claim that anywhere that you want to consider using Cilium, Calico would be just as good, but with a lot more powerful capabilities in the policy model. And one last point I'll make is uh, with Calico, you don't have to worry about getting it implemented in any of your major platforms. It comes out of the box in Rancher, in EKS, in AKS, in GKE, IBM Cloud, and pretty much most distributions as the default option. So come talk to us offline and happy to give you more, more context and, and detail behind that. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll we'll leave it there. If I missed your question, please reach out to us. You can reach out to me at Matthew at rancher.com, you know, or or Slack. Um, I'll make sure Kartik Kartik sees it. Um, Kartik, thank you so much for this fantastic information for your time. Is there anything else uh, you wanna you wanna leave us with before? Uh, I, I will just make this last uh, statement on saying let's tee up for more webinars in the future. I will uh, leave it around the partnership between Tigera and Rancher around collaborating around the network connectivity, network policies. And if you have questions, uh, follow up with us at tigera.io or reach out to us on our community Slack channel, which is slack.projectcalico.org. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. So as I said, this session was recorded. We'll post it on YouTube uh, and we'll, we'll send you all the um, the PowerPoint, the slides uh, and the recording and any, any other files that, that you might need. Um, not with that, that's it. Have a great uh, week, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kartik. Thank you, Matthew. Cheers.